Hello NABU students. <clears throat> now we're starting uh, topic two in the lecture guide and so we're starting at slide 22, the Canadian legal system. Uh, slide 23 uh, <clears throat> starts off with obviously the most appropriate spot and that's the Canadian Constitution. Now the Canadian Constitution is a little different than most other countries. Um, our constitutional documents um, are numerous. Uh, you know, the United States has a Constitution Act, and, uh, and while that's it, uh, Mexico has a Constitution Act, and while that's it, um, we, however, have two cornerstone constitutional documents, one when Canada was formed in 1867, and one when we repatriated our Constitution Act or our Constitution in 1982. What's repatriation mean? Well, our, our constitutional protections for civil liberties, for example, came from tradition. Um, traditionally, with the Magna Carta and onwards, uh, the United Kingdom developed protections of their civil liberties, but it was always um, through the courts, and so it was by tradition as opposed to actually being itemized in a document. So um, we, uh, in 1982, were following the United Kingdom and our, our protections were um, by tradition. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, who uh, was responsible for the repatriation of our constitution, wanted those protections um, outlined. So let's take a look, first of all, at the, um, the cornerstone document, the Constitution Act of 1867, um, when Canada was formed. Its actual name at that time in 1867 was the British North America Act. It's an act of Parliament, and what it did was it created the Confederation of Canada. Um, the United Kingdom is a small country, and so a unitary government worked for it. But in Canada, because of the, the vast size of the country, they decided that they should have a confederation, which meant dividing the powers between the federal government and the provinces. <clears throat> so the British North America Act of 1867 is um, a, a UK uh, statute. That document is actually still in the United Kingdom and it's on display in one of their buildings. And when I was there doing my pilgrimage and uh, to see the Magna Carta, I wanted to get into that building and actually take a look at the British North America Act. Unfortunately, the, the lineup was horrendous, and so I, we decided to give it a pass. We didn't have enough time. Um, Canada has asked on numerous occasions for that document to be sent to Canada uh, so that we would have it here, but uh, the United Kingdom rightfully says no. It was an act of Parliament of the United Kingdom, so it should stay there. Um, <clears throat> that aside, let's look at the uh, two key sections of that document. In section 91, the powers of the federal government were outlined. There was the criminal law, for example, because they wanted the criminal law being consistent across the country. Uh, transportation, because that's a cross-border uh, issue. Um, and then communications, again, because the communications was cross-border, they all fell under the federal government. There's numerous numerous um, uh, items outlined for the federal government. But those are the three key ones specific to a topic. And then there were two um, powers left to the federal government, uh, which were a little different. Um, <clears throat> one was the emergency powers, or the what we call the POG powers, the Peace, Order, and Good Government uh, Clause, which said that in the event of an emergency, like a war or a, a COVID-19 pandemic, um, there had to be a, a, a unified response. Um, so consequently, the emergency powers was given to the federal government. The other one was um, in 1867, the founders, uh, the fathers of Confederation, um, were smart enough, I think, to realize that, that they could not see into the future. Um, I have heard so much. I've been following um, the uh, COVID crisis and the uh, uh, and the crisis of the Trump presidency in the United States long enough to realize that the the Americans are under the impression that their founding fathers were oh, <clears throat> these amazing people, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and they take the position that gosh, they just knew what to put in to the Constitution and they knew how to draft it. And, 
all you have to do is look at the uh, you know the right to bear arms and they were really really not all that clear but anyway um, they think that way well our our founding fathers said okay we cannot see into the future we cannot see the oh for example we cannot see the development of the internet we cannot see the development of cell phones um, and so you know and com and personal computers um, we can't see that we know it's going to happen but we can't see it no they just realized there were things that were going to develop that they just had no idea about. So they gave the residual powers to the federal government. Anything not already covered, which might come up in the future, falls within the powers of the federal government. Section 92 outlines the provincial powers. Um, and they, the provinces have the right for uh, civil and property rights. Oh, civil rights. Oh, that must mean uh, protection against discrimination. No, it has nothing to do with that. Remember when we, uh, we were talking about the um, uh, public law and private law, so I talked about this, the criminal courts, and then I talked about the civil courts or the uh, private law courts. That's what civil means, okay, in that context. So civil and property rights. Property means the ownership of property, including things like guns, okay? Now, education was given to the provinces, um, and that shows a, a lack of forethought, I think. Uh, education was important, but it wasn't paramount like it is today. And so they thought the provinces could have their own education, particularly because Quebec wanted French language education, they wanted French history education, more so than the English provinces. And so consequently, they gave uh, the provinces the right to education. So we do not have any consistency across the country. Uh, the, federal, uh, the provincial governments were given uh, the, the right to uh, certain provincial taxation and things like that. So there's more, more items than just listed on uh, slide 23. Um, uh, but one of the one of the key ones was uh, they gave the provincial governments the right to establish uh, municipal governments um, and uh, and to uh, do the laws for them. Uh, <clears throat> so um, what the, what this meant was we had um, uh, no consistency because the prov provincial government said, oh well, you know. Passing bylaws for, uh, you know, not spitting on the sidewalk and uh, snow removal and things like that. That's small potatoes. And so let's just delegate it to the uh, municipalities. So they delegated it to the uh, cities, towns, um, villages, boroughs, and shires. Well, we have no shires. You know, we have no hobbits. That's that's a joke from the, um, uh, <clears throat> the book about the hobbits and... Uh, uh, but the England had shires, you know, the Shire of Nottingham uh, was the sheriff of the Shire of Nottingham. And um, uh, we, don't ha we don't have boroughs per se, um, although there were some in Ontario in the early years. There was Peterborough and Scarborough, but they've developed into cities. So these, these um, municipalities had the right to make their own laws. And again, there's a lack of consistency, but it's not terribly critical. All right, so that was our one cornerstone document. The other cornerstone document is the Constitution Act of 1982. Um, the, the really important element of this is it incorporates um, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, I always have a, a sort of a trap uh, in my exam questions. Uh, sometimes I say, what is the statute that protects our civil liberties? The knee-jerk reaction is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is not actually a statute, okay? The statute is the Con uh, Constitution Act of 1982, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is attached as an annex to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, it outlines our fundamental freedoms, uh, and the legal rights um, are uh, protected, supposedly, in uh, Section 1, the the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject to only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and legal or free and democratic society. Okay, so the, 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 there's those two documents. Um, now, <clears throat> what? why do I say it's in numerous documents? 
in actual fact, as um, our constitutional document started in 1763, uh, General uh, Brock uh, defeated General Montcalm. General Brock was the general for the English. Montcalm was the French general. They met on the plains of Abraham. They battled it out, and the British won, and France ceded the colony of Quebec to Canada. Uh, they did this in the uh, Proclamation of 1763. Well, that's got to be one of our constitutional documents, all right? Um, and then uh, very shortly thereafter, the United States starts getting muscly and, and belligerent, and they have this manifest destiny where they're going to take over the whole of North America, and, and so they're, they're sort of eyeing the Canadian provinces to the north. Uh, Britain had a huge empire, was fighting wars everywhere, um, and thought to themselves, well, we don't have enough strength to actually prevent the United States from taking over Canada, particularly if Quebec, the, you know, French Canadians really didn't like the, the British, particularly if the uh, Quebec colonists um, did, not, uh, did not side with uh, the British. And so what they did in 1774 was they passed the uh, Quebec Act, which allowed French Canada to keep its language, its religion, um, and its laws. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the laws, well, what was the laws? Well, the law was civil law, uh, because the French, that was a French colony, and the civil code was applicable there. Well, they were allowed to keep their civil law. Um, and then eventually, um, in uh, uh, 1867, four provinces joined together to form Canada. There was Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. And then after that, okay, other provinces joined. Well, um, Manitoba joined first in 1870 as a very small province. They called it the postage stamp province because it was, or it was like a square. And then eventually they incorporated more territory and it became a little rectangle and then it, it now is the shape it is today. Um, so consequently, in 1870, that joining Canada is part of a constitutional document and then as it expanded there's two more documents that uh, become part of our constitution. Um, British Columbia joined in 1871. The deal was if uh, Canada, the four provinces, built a railway, uh, I guess there's uh, five provinces at that point, built a railway from central Canada to British Columbia we would join. The Canadian Pacific Railway was completed. 1871 BC becomes a province. Uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan joined in 1905 uh, to become provinces. Those are constitutional documents. Um, then in 1949, for example, the, uh, Newfoundland and um, Labrador joined. Uh, <clears throat> 1931, I think it was, the Statute of Westminster allows Canadians to have their own ambassadors internationally. Um, in 1949, we had a statute that said the uh, Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the land. Up until then, you could actually appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada and then make an ultimate appeal to the Privy Council in England. Um, and it's an ongoing process. Um, Canada is made up of 10 provinces and three territories, but originally it was only two territories, uh, the Yukon and Northwest Territories. Northwest Territories was vast, and there was obviously differences in the uh, makeup of the population. So in 1991, or pardon me, 1999, we have another constitutional document which creates the territory of Nunavut. Um, okay, so this, all those together make up our uh, constitutional document. And quite often in uh, uh, my midterm exams, I put a question on about, uh, uh, you know, our constitution, the division of powers, um, and why our Constitution is said to be made up of many documents as opposed to just one. The next slide, which is slide 25, uh, we get into some of the mechanics of the Canadian legal system. And there's sources of law in Canada, um, obviously, and, and I wanted to describe those a little bit. Um, first of all, there is judge-made law. Um, we've talked about precedent in the common law jurisdictions. Um, well, judges make decisions and those judgments become precedent in subsequent cases. And so there's this body of judge-made law um, out there. 
Now, you'd think that nowadays with the uh, legislatures and the House of Commons passing legislation, there would be no more judge-made law. In fact, there is in two respects. First of all, there are things not covered by statute. For example, if um, one of you was an irritating student and I got upset in class and I went, and I gave that student a sock to the jaw, um, I could be charged with a criminal offense. That's fine. The government um, convicts me and I have to pay them a fine. Does not help that student recover damages to repair his jaw and his teeth because I am so strong that I caused all sorts of damages. Um, what that student would have to do is they would have to sue me for battery, which is a common law tort. Um, battery is the merest unconsented to intentional touching of another, as we'll see later on in the course. So he, he sues me to get, get damages and an injunction to stop me from doing it in the future. Um, well, there's no battery act. You know, there's a sale of goods act. There's a competition act. There's a river rafting uh, act. There's a beekeepers act. Oh, there's, we have so many statutes, but there is not a tort act or a battery act. So what that student would have to do, or that student solicitor, uh, pardon me, barrister, would actually have to go and look at case law and find some cases where somebody socks somebody in a jaw, and that's the tort, and so that case would be used as precedent. And then you could get a number of cases which gave a range of compensation so that you could establish the damages. All right, so that judge-made law. The other way that judge-made law is, uh, is created is interpreting statutes. The legislature or the House of Commons pass a statute, and there's a sort of a saying at law that that statute or a provision in it is not finally settled until it has been judicially interpreted. Um, so uh, so there is, there's still judge-made law occurring. Um, now, I'm talking about statutes. There's statutes like uh, the Criminal Code, the Human Rights Code, the Labor Relations Code, Sale of Goods Act, um, the Competition Act, the Business Practices and Consumer Protection Act. There's all sorts of statutes out there. Now, what's a code and what's an act? Um, it depends upon uh, the nature of the, uh, uh, of the statute itself. I think one reason why the criminal code is called the criminal code rather than the criminal act is that inside that document, of course, there is a criminal act that a perpetrator uh, does in order to commit a crime. So it would be unclear if you talked about the criminal act, meaning the whole statute of all the sections and the criminal act of a, of a, a, a perpetrator. So they call it a criminal code. Um, I, that's the only reason I can think of, because there's really no discernible difference between a code and an act. They are both statutes. Okay, so in BC, for example, the BC government passes the Labor Relations Code. Um, and this is the statute that governs negotiations and uh, problems between uh, the BC government and the civil service union, or BC businesses and their labor unions. Uh, so it establishes how um, you you get to a, uh, a collective agreement. But then if there's a dispute over the wording of the collective agreement, the Labor Relations Code does not give you the procedural law necessary to actually uh, settle that matter. And so the, the Labor Minister is said to be the responsible minister in the Labor Relations Code. And the labor minister is given the power to pass regulations for the, um, the application of the code. So you've got statutes and regulations. Okay, they go together. Um, now, just I'm going to jump down to the bottom of slide, it was at 25, because there we see that difference between statutes and regulations a bit clearer. Substantive law is the rights and duties of each person in society. What's that mean? Well, the criminal code says that, you know, you shouldn't uh, rob somebody, you shouldn't shoot somebody, you shouldn't uh, peddle drugs. Um, that's the substantive law. Those are the things that you should not do. Um, it, at common law, uh, judge-made law, uh, there's a rule that says you should not breach enforceable contracts. 
Um, and so that's the substantive law. Oh, and, and also, you know, popping that uh, student on the chin, um, you should not commit a battery. So we have this situation where we have substantive law. But let's say you and I have a, a contract and um, you breach that contract and I want to sue you. Uh, how do I do that? Um, you're sued. No, that's obviously not not what we're talking about. Um, the procedural law uh, then provides a whole series of rules that allows me to avail myself of the uh, provisions of our court system in order to sue you. I have to go down to the courthouse. I have to fill out a notice of civil claim if it's the Supreme Court or the notice of claim if it's the provincial court, small claims. And I have to pay a fee, get it stamped by the registry. I have to serve it on the defendant. The defendant then has a certain period of time in which they can file a uh, statement of defense um, if it's a Supreme Court matter or a uh, reply if it's a small claims court matter. And thereby, bingo, we have this procedure that will allow the court system to resolve the claim. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, the legislatures pass um, uh, statutes in order to, uh, for the better government of Canada. Um, but what happens if there's a situation where um, <clears throat> the, uh, let's take the provincial legislature, for example, want to pass a, a law that um, is not contentious at all, okay? Um, and a good example of that is um, the re Register of the Land Title Office in BC is responsible for keeping hard documents of all documents filed with them. So I buy a house, I file a Form A. I have to get a mortgage to buy the house, I file a Form B. Um, I want to uh, develop property, so I have to file a, uh, a covenant covering the property. Um, the government comes along and says, okay, yeah, you're developing this property, but we have a, um, a uh, electric uh, line going through there, and so we need a right-of-way. And along comes the municipality and says, okay, you've got all that property, but, you know, we have to go on there and provide sewers. So we have to have, um, uh, you know, uh, access to your property, and so we have to file um, either rights-of-way or, um, uh, what's the other name? It escapes me right now, rights of way or easements, okay? And and so all these documents are filed at the land title office. And um, the registrar has to keep copies. Well, the registrar now has buildings and buildings and buildings full of all these documents. And the registrar has to be able to provide people, lawyers who ask to do a search on the property, copies of these documents. The danger is they not only have to keep a whole set of the documents here, but they have to keep another whole set of the copies over here because this building might burn down. And so they've got buildings and buildings full of all these documents. The registrar says in the electronic age, that is silly. I could put all the documents in that one building on one CD. So, uh, but he's not allowed to because the law says the registrar must keep a hard copy. So the registrar wants to change that law to allow him or her to keep electronic copies. Do we want our House of Commons, no, it wouldn't be the House of Commons, do we want our BC legislature to then introduce a bill in first reading, do second reading, have it go to a committee to be studied, go back for third reading, a vote, and then go to the Lieutenant Governor to be voted upon? No, because nobody cares except the Registrar of the Land Title Office. So these kinds of routine legislation can be passed by orders in council. Council? What's the council? Well, in actual fact, we don't have a provincial cabinet. Um, it's a council of uh, provincial ministers. Uh, but that doesn't, that sounds like small potatoes. I don't want to be a councillor. I want to be a cabinet minister. Sounds better, right? So by tradition, we have cabinet ministers and a cabinet. Um, by law, um, if you read the actual wording of the law, we have a council. So you have this document, and uh, if I'm able to put chapter um, one on 
uh, Moodle, and um, I'm waiting to find out. Um, in that chapter, there is actually a picture of an order in council, and it's on page 23. Basically, at the top, there's a place for the lieutenant governor to sign, but that's not until after it is completed, okay? Um, there's the, uh, the, the law is written out by the attorney general. He signs it. The presiding member of the executive council signs it. Who's the presiding member of the executive council? Well, that's our premier, okay? Um, or if the premier isn't around, then it would be the deputy premier would sign it. So once that's done and the wording of the statute is attached to it, and this one is actually concerning uh, the land title office, um, then it goes to the lieutenant governor, okay, because it's now passed by our legislature, but it's not yet law. And the lieutenant governor of the province of Canada uh, signs it and then proclaims it law by depositing it in the, in the records of the government. Um, now, who's the lieutenant governor? We, uh, we've completely divorced ourselves from the United Kingdom with the repatriation of our, our um, constitution in 1982. Almost completely divorced ourselves from the United Kingdom. Uh, who's the head of state? Uh, well, uh, the head of state is the queen. Okay, so the queen is, Queen Elizabeth II is still head of state in Canada. Um, and, uh, but, you know, she's over there in England and she's doing her thing in England. Uh, you know, she has nothing to do with uh, running Canada. But the Queen's representative um, federally is the Governor General of Canada. And the Queen's representative in each of the provinces is the Lieutenant Governor. So the Queen's representative in the province of British Columbia would sign the order in council. That would make it law. Um, okay, and we're talking about the, the law of Canada. So uh, nine provinces and the three territories are common law. Quebec has civil law. Completely? No. Um, the public law, um, the Criminal Code, Competition Act, um, all those statutes the, you know, are for all of Canada, okay, including Quebec. Provincially, however, remember in Section 92, Civil and Property Rights? Well, civilly in the province of British Columbia, we have common law. Civilly in the province of Quebec, they have civil law. Okay? Um, and so the civil code in Quebec, which incidentally is not one book, it's a multitude of books because it's like basically the same as all BC statutes. The civil code applies to private law in Quebec. Then the next category, uh, number five on my list, and there's no, no magic to that numbering system, that's just me, is administrative law. We have um, uh, the Labor Relations Board in the province of British Columbia. Now, I'm just going to glance ahead at my slides. Um, yeah, on... Uh, on slide 28, when we look at an overview of Canada's um, uh, court system, we see at the bottom of the federal uh, line um, something called federal administrative tribunals, and then we see at the bottom of the provincial line something called provincial administrative tribunals. Um, these are not courts per se, because they're not run by judges. They are run by um, appointees from the provincial government. Um, and they were brought into our system because our courts were being overrun with cases. The backlogs were terrible. So they thought, well, let's get to these administrative tribunals, seeing how many of these cases just a government representative making a decision at a tribunal level can um, uh, eliminate this, this flood of cases. Um, if the decisions in those cases are not satisfactory to the parties, then they can be appealed. Uh, for example, at the provincial level, uh, the provincial uh, administrative tribunal gets appealed to the provincial Supreme Court, um, which in BC is the BC Provincial Supreme Court. You do not go to the, the um, uh, uh, provincial uh, uh, courts per se. Okay, provincial court is small claims. Uh, BC Supreme Court is the uh, uh, is the uh, uh, other court in BC. So you go to the BC Supreme Court and you get a decision, final and binding, <clears throat> no further appeals. 
So it cuts down the backlog in our court system. Uh, well, the when the Labor Relations Board makes a decision on a dispute between a um, business and its union, it looks at precedent and <clears throat> it follows the precedent and they issue a, um, a decision and it looks like judge-made law. It So it sort of looks like, walks like, quacks like a uh, duck. Is it a duck? Uh, <clears throat> well, in fact, no. Okay. Um, so it's not judge-made law. And the reason is that administrative tribunals are not bound by precedent. Precedent allows for predictability and consistency, though. And so the Labor Relations Board slavishly follows precedent. So much so, that, you know, it used to be that you could appeal from the Labor Relations Board to the BC Supreme Court and then from the BC Supreme Court to the Court of Appeal. Um, and <clears throat> they've eliminated uh, the appeals because the Labor Relations Board is just so good at what it does, all right? So you have this body of, of law being built up, but it's not judge-made law. Um, it's called administrative law. So you have the Labor Relations Board, you have the Employment Standards Branch, and I've done Employment Standards Branch hearings, and I've brought in cases, and the hearing officers have always followed those cases. So um, again, they, uh, they build up this body of law which looks like precedent and can be used by precedent, but it is not necessarily final. Um, in my <clears throat> legal career, I'm really fortunate. Um, I've done administrative tribunal um, uh, cases, and I've done small claims court cases, and I have done Supreme Court cases, and I've even done one court of appeal in BC case. Um, and I've I only lost once. Okay, uh, now I did lose some provincial small claims court cases, but in each case they were appealed to the BC Supreme Court and. Um, the uh, decision of the lower course was overturned and I did win. So I, I'm feeling you know pretty good about that. Um, the one case that I lost was a workers' compensation board case because um, WCB, when someone dies, uh, pays out money to the, uh, uh, the deceased's spouse. One of my clients' wife died um, and WCB said, yes, we're going to take this whack of money and we're going to give it to you. Now, how they give it to you is critical because if they give it to you over a number of years, then you can minimize the tax consequences. But if they give you a lump sum payment in that one year, it would be added to your income and put you in a really high tax bracket and the government takes back um, something like 50 to 55 percent of it. <clears throat> so consequently, um, uh, they, they always did it over a number of years. When my client made the claim, um, they said, oh, we're just going to give you a lump sum. And he came in and he said, whoa, he said, if they do that, uh, you know, I'm, pff, they're going to take so much money back. And so we went to a hearing and I brought in cases where they had done it over the, you know, a series, a number of years. And they just said, yeah, uh, we know, but we've decided to change our mind. We think it'll be a lot easier for us if we just get a lump sum payment and like, who cares about you, right? Um, and um, uh, then there, you have 60 days to do an appeal inside the administrative tribunal. And um, uh, my client said, okay, should we appeal? And I said, it's up to you. Um, but they're not bound by precedent, so they didn't make a mistake. Okay, so when you appeal, it's unlikely you'll be successful. So he elected not to go for an appeal. And um, uh, <clears throat> because there had been a couple of other appeals on the same basis and they'd all been dismissed. So he didn't want to spend the money on the appeal and I don't blame him. So then 11 months later, the workers' compensation goes, oh, you know what, ah, oh, gee, you know, we think it would be better if we gave, uh, you know, yearly payments. And my client came back to me and he said, well, you know, what about me? And I said, well, you fell between the, clock, the cracks. They are not bound by precedent. They can flip-flop back and forth and there's nothing you can do about it. They're not bound by precedents because they're not judges. Okay, so anyway, that's the uh, uh, the administrative uh, tribunal system. Uh, back to slide 25, uh, administrative law, that body of law done by administrative tribunals. 
Uh, oh, and incidentally, where do you get the name Tribunal? It bothered me for years because um, Tri sounded like three. So I expected a tribunal to have three government officials, maybe because they're not as good as judges, right? And so when I started going before the tribunals, there was always one officer. And it, it was one of those things that, you know, nagged at the back of my mind for the longest time, uh, which just goes to show the more you read, uh, the more you're well read, um, the more you're going to know. I was reading a novel written by a, um, uh, an author in BC, Jack White. He wrote about the Knights of uh, uh, the Round Table. He wrote about the uh, Knights Templar. And I was reading all those books. And he wrote about um, the early uh, governor of Rome in uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, in there, there were disputes, of course, that occurred within the Roman army. Okay, so it's it's um, uh, trial by ordeal and trial by fire for um, the, the the Brits. But inside the Roman army, if there was a dispute, the dispute would go to a tribunal. And it described the tribunal as an officer at a certain level inside the Roman army. Okay, so just an officer of BC is the tribunal. I don't think that'll be on the exam. Anyway, then there's the um, the sixth uh, source of law, and that's the municipal bylaws and regulations. All the little municipalities, the cities, and everything can make up their own uh, uh, rules. Uh, it, and as I said, there's no consistency. For example, in North Vancouver, um, the city of North Vancouver, uh, if it snows, you have to clean the sidewalk in front of your house. Okay. And it snowed one year when I lived there and I rushed out because I knew the law and I cleaned my portion of the sidewalk and I looked up and down the whole street. Nobody else cleared theirs because nobody knew the law. <laughs> and it, it turned out it didn't matter anyway. But that's the city of North Vancouver. The division between North Vancouver and the city and the district is Lonsdale. And on the east side of Lonsdale, the law is different. You do not have to clean its sidewalk. So again, uh, there's these laws. Then I added uh, seven, uh, the seventh one, military law. Not that we have anything to do with it. It's just to be more complete. Uh, we have a, uh, a military code of conduct. We have uh, military police, uh, military prisons, uh, military uh, lawyers, military judges. Um, uh, you know, a whole system of... Uh, uh, courts uh, for the for, and, and laws for the military. So I just put it in there to be complete. Now the eighth one, um, we have to be a little careful about. And I mean that because um, international law is very distinct from the other law. Okay. Um, and so I put it in there because um, uh, I thought, particularly looking at uh, uh, you know North American law, we should realize that besides the law of BC and the law of Canada, there's this international law which transcends boundaries. Um, now, uh, it can be judge-made law. Uh, for example, we will go through a case called Sharn Importing versus Babchuck. It involves a uh, Quebec business, a BC business, and the BC business has a, a, an office in Ont uh, Alberta. So it's cross borders and it is international and yet it's inside Canada. Um, <clears throat> but then there's also cases where a BC business is suing a business in, in the United States or vice versa. So there's judgment law that goes across boundaries and that falls under international law. <clears throat> and then there's public law on top of that. There is the US, um, Mexico, Canada agreement uh, which is the uh, precursor of the um, uh, precursor? No, that's before the uh, uh, the the as a result of the amendment to the uh, North American Free Trade Act, um, because it's cross border and it's public, it falls under statutes and regulations, and yet it's very much different than the BC's uh, Sale of Goods Act, for example. And then there's the uh, conventions passed by uh, the United Nations, which apply to all three countries. Um, and uh, 
uh, even though it might require enabling legislation by either the federal government or the provinces, it is it's somewhat distinct. So I just separated them out. Um, now, I've been talking about public law and private law, and um, uh, a further clarification of that is public law is the conduct of government uh, on one side and the government on the other. So this would be a constitutional challenge. The federal government tries to pass gun control legislation and the province would say, no, no, that's civil and property rights because guns are property. We should regulate it. You can cannot do it. And so they would do a constitutional challenge, public law. Uh, the, the case of uh, Regina versus Dudley and Stevens, uh, Regina means the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens, two individuals, the government on the one side, private people on the other, public law. Uh, Canada Revenue Agency versus Graham, uh, the uh, government on one side and a person on the other, uh, private law, or public law rather. Private law is uh, Holden versus Graham. Graham breaches my contract, I sue him. The government doesn't care. Okay, the government gives us a court system to resolve our problem, but they don't care whether I'm right or he's, he's right. Okay, so uh, that's private law. Or um, groups of persons, you can have um, a, an unregistered society, which is just a group of people versus um, a, a supplier, something like that, okay? Um, or you might have um, three plaintiffs uh, who were you know, injured in a car crash and they're um, suing a, you know, the negligent driver because they think they should be compensated more than the insurance. Well, there, that would be three separate lawsuits, but the judges won't go for that. They'll consolidate the cases because the three people were injured by the same accident. Okay, so people on one side uh, and a, a group on one side and a private person on the other. Um, all right, um, there are See the public and private diagram in the lecture materials. That's the, the books that you buy at the bookstore. I show a little um, uh, uh, diagram of a scale. And on one side, it lists the uh, things that fall under the um, uh, public law and the list of the things that fall under private law. We've already talked about the, you know, um, international, you know, falling under both. Um, the other thing that falls under both is administrative law. Um, because the Labor Relations Code, for example, resolves public law disputes between the government and the civil service, but it also resolves disputes between uh, private businesses and unions. Um, but at, at the top of the list, uh, there's the uh, constitutional matters. That's obviously public. Now, the Constitution Act is not a source of law because it is just a statute, Constitution Act. So it's covered by um, acts and regulations in the previous uh, diagram, or on, in slide uh, 25. <clears throat> but then there's the criminal code, obviously, and then there's marketing and advertising law. And that sounds like it should be on the other side. That sounds like business. But when someone falsely or misleadingly advertises a product, the um, uh, uh, you, you make a complaint to the Competition Bureau, which is one of those administrative tribunals that I talked about, and then they go after the person that has falsely advertised their products. So it's on the, um, the, uh, the public law side. Um, on the private law side, you've got contracts. Now, it's not a perfect division again because you might have a contract with the government, so they don't pay you. You sue them. Um, it's a private law matter, but it just happens to involve the government. So there's uh, competition, at, pardon me, the um, contracts, there's torts, um, there's wills and estates, there's uh, property law, the ownership of property, um, that sort of thing on that side. Okay, um, enough said about that. Now we're getting into the court system. And this is, um, let me just see where we are here time-wise because, uh, um, yeah, okay, we can just do the court system and then I'll take a short break and come back. Um, yeah, all right. So uh, this is the, an overview of the court system in BC and there's a trap here. And that is that on the exam, quite often, I give that diagram, but I eliminate the court martial and military courts, okay? Because that's just not applicable to, to commercial law. So we're looking at the federal uh, sphere and the uh, provincial sphere. Um, and um, this is an overview of Canada's courts. So under the uh, uh, provincial area, you'll see provincial and territory supreme or superior courts. 
we do not have a superior court in BC, okay? Or a court called the Superior Court, okay? We do have a Superior Court, but it's called the Supreme Court of BC. They use a generic term because the provinces can use any name they want. BC, it's the um, BC Supreme Court, Nova Scotia, it's the Nova Scotia Supreme Court, Alberta, it's the Alberta Queen's Bench, Saskatchewan, it's the Saskatchewan Queen's Bench. I'm not sure where the Manitoba's changed. In Ontario, there's the High Court, okay? And in Quebec, there is something called a Superior Court. So the trap is, if I put that diagram on the exam, and I hope you're listening, um, I could say, uh, this is a five mark question, identify five courts of first instance and um, uh, explain uh, th them. All right, so um, you would say, oh, well, there's the provincial small claims court um, and then there's the Superior Court of BC. Yeah, no, it's the Supreme Court of BC, okay? And then you're, you're gonna lose some marks. Um, so just watch out for that. Um, we have the uh, provincial court, which has five divisions, which you don't have to know, but it's um, small claims, uh, criminal court, family court, juvenile court, and um, uh, the traffic court. Okay, so, um, but it's just called Provincial Court of BC. And then uh, you can appeal from the Provincial Court of BC to the Superior Court of BC, no, to the Supreme Court of BC. And then if you have appeal, you can appeal to the BC Court of Appeal. And then you can apply to appeal to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, maybe. Okay, so that's the, um, the system. Now below the uh, courts is the administrative tribunals, but we've already dealt for that. Okay, so that's the that's the provincial side. Now, small claims uh, provincial court has a monetary limit, and it used to be five thousand dollars, and then they were thinking, well, let's increase it to ten thousand, but no, they increased it to twenty five thousand instead, and I think they've increased it to thirty five thousand uh, dollars. But I am going to, in a moment, when I take my break, check to see if they've actually upped that. They were talking about making the small claims court limit $50,000. So if I want to sue you for breach of contract, <clears throat> it has to be under $50,000. Um, if it's $55,000, I can make up my mind to go in small claims, which would be less expensive and faster, um, if I forego the five, okay? Uh, so instead of suing for $55,000 that you owe me, I would sue for $50,000 so I could go on small claims. But you can start in, in the BC Supreme Court if you're owed $10. Um, the only reason you wouldn't would be it was so expensive, but if there was another issue related to that, for example, a defamation, which small claims cannot do, or a property law matter, which small claims cannot do, then you would sue in BC Supreme Court. Okay, any court, you can start there. Uh, it's just that it might be more financially benefit, beneficial to start in small claims. Um, okay, so that's the uh, provincial court side. Um, now, we have the federal court side, and there's two, two courts where you can start. One is the federal court. Um, if you had a marine law issue, uh, falls under the government. If you have a Bank Act issue, it falls under the federal government. So you'd start there. If you have an intellectual property claim, you would start there. Preferably, you could start that one in the BC Supreme Court. The problem with that is you someone's um, infringing your trademark. You sue them for trademark infringement and you win in BC. Yay! But then you have to register it in Alberta and then you have to register it in Saskatchewan. You have to register it in Manitoba and on and on and on. Whereas if, in order to stop someone in Canada from infringing your trademark, if you go to the federal court, you get a judgment which is good all across Canada. Okay, so there's strategy behind that. Now, the other court that you can start in is the tax court. Um, that is, um, uh, handles only matters with respect to the Tax Act. Um, and the interesting thing about that is if you lose, you have the right to appeal to the Federal Court of Appeal that's the court of last instance, okay? You and you lose in federal court, you cannot you cannot appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. The judges in the Supreme Court of Canada have made it plain that they will not hear any tax cases. Um, 
they're they're far too busy and far too important, I guess, um, uh, to be you know have their docket cluttered with those matters. So federal court of appeal is the final court from the tax uh, act. Okay, now I, I actually mentioned that it might be on the exam, and you'd have to tell me five courts of first instance. Um, this is a term which is not in the lecture guide, but is one that you should know uh, for um, uh, examination purposes. What's a court of first instance? Well, pretty obviously, if you look at the words, it means where you have to start. Okay. Now, when you look at this diagram and you eliminate the uh, uh, military courts, um, the tribunals aren't courts, so that doesn't count. Well, provincial court in BC is a court of first instance. Um, you can start in the BC Supreme Court. Okay, good so far. Um, BC Court of Appeal? No, Court of Appeal. By the very name, you cannot start there. Federal court. Uh, okay, well, the federal court, is, you start there with a trademark or a marine law issue or a bank act issue. Um, and then tax court. Oh, well, it's a court. So those are four. And then you look at the diagram and you go, what's the other one? Well, the only other one <laughs> that it can be is the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, Supreme Court of Canada handles appeals from you and I. Okay, but... If there is a constitutional challenge between BC and the federal government, for example, um, you do not start in the BC Supreme Court. Okay, um, you can make a um, a reference directly to the Supreme Court. So it would be reference re Gun Control Act because the federal government wants to file. Um, an act or pass an act called the gun control um, and BC says no wait a minute that falls under our powers civil and property rights and the federal government saying no no we're doing it to combat crime um, well um, there will be a constitutional challenge there if BC had to start in the BC Supreme Court and it took you know three to five years to get in there and then it had to appeal to the BC Court of Appeal and it took two more years and then it had to appeal and it took uh, three more years to get into the uh, Supreme Court of Canada that'd be 10 years well the federal government would have passed the gun control legislation and started implementing it which means licensing uh, owners of guns collecting money uh, starting a gun control registry, uh, searching and seizing without warrant because they, uh, uh, they, they, they suspect somebody has guns. And they, if you do that, and there's all sorts of court cases, and there's also fines, and there's all sorts of taxes collected by the federal government, and, and then the BC finally gets all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada says, that legislation is ultra varies the powers of the federal government, which means beyond the powers of. So they strike it down. What do they do with the people they put in jail? What do they do with the tax money that they've collected and spent? What do they do with the gun registry, which has all sorts of personal information in it? It would be absolute chaos. So when there's a constitutional challenge, um, the provinces and the federal government cannot wait and work their way through the system. So they're allowed to make a reference right to the Supreme Court of Canada for a declaratory judgment. Okay, there's another term you should know. A declaratory judgment. It means the act hasn't been passed yet, so they're not interpreting it, whether, you know, what it means. They're deciding whether it should be passed or not. Okay, so declaratory judgment. Okay, so the five courts of first instance, BC Supreme Court, BC Provincial Court, Federal Court, Tax Court, and the Supreme Court of Canada. Okay, all right. Now I'm just going to take a short break here uh, uh, so that I can um, uh, get another cup of coffee uh, and then we'll be back. Okay, I'm back after my break. I had a cup of coffee, I had a grilled cheese sandwich, and uh, uh, now I am uh, getting into slide uh, 29 dealing with a criminal law case versus a civil law case. But before I do that, I said I would check on the um, small claims court limit, and it is still at $35,000 in BC. 
Uh, now, criminal law versus uh, uh, civil or private law um, case, see the lecture materials. In there, I put in a diagram, I believe, showing the difference. Um, I've, uh, <clears throat> uh, but I've also got it in my text, and if I can get that onto the uh, Moodle, then we'll have, um, it'll even be better. Um, however, um, what this does is it demonstrates the uh, criminal court process, which is public law matter where someone's charged with an offense, and a civil court process, which deals with the um, situation where I'm suing someone over a breach of contract, which is more applicable to our course. Anyway, um, on, the, on the criminal law side, right at the top it says a crime has been committed. It's um, assault, uh, battery, uh, uh, armed robbery, murder, uh, drug offenses, that sort of thing. And the charge goes to the Crown um, Counsel, Crown Prosecutor, who has a great deal of um, leeway whether or not it goes ahead. Um, the matter can be stayed, um, which means it's put on hold. Um, <clears throat> for example, they may have insufficient evidence to actually get a conviction at trial. The police are still looking into the matter, so they, put it, they stay it for a while. Um, or they can go ahead. So it will be the Crown versus the accused. Okay, so it's the Crown, meaning the, the public law, government on one side, the accused being an individual on the other. The uh, trial uh, <clears throat> is, it, it goes to court. What's the level of proof? Well, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a very high level of proof. Not absolute, um, but beyond a reasonable doubt means if there's any doubt, then it has to be um, found in favor of the accused to prevent sending uh, as many innocent people as possible to jail. I mean, we do, unfortunately, send some innocent people to jail, um, but <clears throat> it's because the system is run by uh, humans and we make mistakes. So beyond the reasonable doubt, the accused has the choice of trial by judge alone or trial by judge and jury. And um, what this means is the, well, let's look at it this way. Um, Regina versus Dudley and Stevens was a case where three men and a boy were lost in a life raft in the South Atlantic. Uh, the men kill, uh, two of the men kill the boy and the three of them eat the boy's body to try to survive. This is in 1884. They're finally rescued um, and they're put on trial for murder. Well, you would never have a judge and a jury because, I mean, the jury would have, uh, you know, women that are mothers and, and men that are fathers on there and you they killed this young boy. Um, and so, you know, the, your, your guilty decision would be uh, almost absolute. Their defense was that it was absolutely necessary for them to do that to save their lives and the lives of their families back in England who would have been in poor house and, uh, and work, slave workshops and things like that um, had, they, uh, had they perished. So they said it was necessary. Well, the, the defense of necessity is a very technical term. And a jury would go, oh, yeah, you killed a boy. Who cares about that? Well, a judge alone can say it's terrible that they killed a boy. But let's look at this legal argument, okay? Whereas there's other times when you want to have a jury trial. Um, on the civil law side, for example, um, if somebody injures you in a car accident, um, a civil trial with a jury um, the jury's more likely to be very sympathetic to the injured plaintiff, okay? So anyway, uh, the accused gets to choose judge or a judge and jury, and it's 12 of your peers. So if you're a drug dealer, does that mean you get 12 drug dealers on your on, uh, the jury? No. <clears throat> Innocent until proven guilty in common law. So they assume you are an upstanding member of the community until such time as you are convicted. Therefore, they're looking for 12 upstanding people in the community. How do they find them? They just go to the, the voters list and they look down and they take a big batch of people and they send them jury summonses and then they have to turn up to, be see, to see if they get uh, elected to the jury. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, if it goes to trial, at the end of the trial, there's a verdict, okay? 
and the verdict is either guilty or innocent, okay? Um, and if it's innocent, then the accused goes free. If they're guilty, then there's another almost little trial after that called the sentencing hearing. When um, uh, the uh, accused gets, or the convicted person gets to bring in evidence about, um, this is a first time offense, uh, I've never been in trouble with the law, I belong to the church, I go to church regularly, I'm on the bake sale committee, I volunteer with uh, uh, charity in my, um, uh, <clears throat> in my community, all the good things that the person has done. And then the Crown Prosecutor gets to point out, uh, uh, well, this is their only time they were convicted. They were charged with five other counts that, you know, were not proved and, and things like that, okay? And then they decide whether or not, or the judge then decides how long the person goes to jail for. Um, the civil court process... It starts off with a breach of a contract or a tortious liability uh, or an estate matter. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the matter then goes to uh, uh, the court, but not through the Crown. Uh, it, and the plaintiff has to start an action in the Supreme Court of BC, um, or the claimant has to start an action in the small claims uh, court in BC. And then if it's a plaintiff versus the defendant or the claimant versus the defendant as opposed to the crown versus the accused. Now you have to be careful because um, we see a lot of American TV and it's and it's the um, uh, prosecution versus the defendant. They call the accused the defendant down there. That's, that's US law. Up here we call them the accused. Um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, civil claims filed in uh, both small claims and the Supreme Court registry. Um, <clears throat> very, uh, a much reduced, I was going to say very few, but no, a much reduced number actually go to trial because between the time that the uh, lawsuit is commenced and the trial date, um, there are settlements. Uh, Insurance companies used to have a terrible reputation because you would make an insurance claim and they'd deny it. Um, and then you would wind up suing them and it would take something like one to three years to get into court. And so they would battle and battle and battle until the courthouse steps. You're going up the day of the trial and the insurance company would say, okay, we'll settle. Uh, they would do that uh, um, obviously, because if it's a you know million dollar claim, who gets the interest on the money, the million dollars for the three years waiting for trial? They do. Okay, so the longer they can hold on to the money, the better off they are. So they tend to deny liability on their claims, um, and and then they would uh, uh, have a settlement on the courthouse steps. Okay, trial in a civil court. Uh, what level of proof? Well, it's on a balance of probabilities. The scales of justice are absolutely level. The plaintiff must prove his or her case, or in small claims, the claimant must prove his or her case. And all you have to do is get one side of that scale of justice to tilt in their favor. Okay? Remember the experiments you used to do in um, high school? We had a vacuum chamber and a scale inside, and you and it was perfectly balanced. And you would put a feather on one side, and that feather was sufficient to make that scale tip. Same thing in uh, civil court. Uh, Fifty point zero 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 one percent. The plaintiff is correct. The plaintiff wins. Okay. Um, now I'm being a little <coughs> facetious with the numbers, but. Um, the uh, <clears throat> either the judge or the judge and jury have to feel that the uh, plaintiff has made out his or her case. Uh, so if it goes to trial, it's either by judge or judge and jury. And um, if it's judge and jury, then it's eight of your peers rather than 12, because a civil matter is not as serious as a criminal matter <clears throat> based on the fact that uh, the criminal matter has punishment related to it, where civil matter is just supposed to be compensation. Um, you, you have a, a decision by the judge. Um, in um, a criminal matter, it's called a verdict. 
uh, in a civil law matter, it's just called a judgment. Now, um, these are terms as they are usually and most often used, although um, judges in criminal matter can say, um, my judgment is in favor of the accused. Okay, so they're, they're not bound to use specific terminology, but generally it's considered a verdict is criminal law matter, judgment is a civil law matter, as opposed to example, the third situation where it is by um, an arbitration. And in that case, um, the arbitration's deci arbiter's decision is called an award. So you get a, a verdict, a judgment, and an award. Good exam question there somewhere. If the judgment is in favor of the plaintiff or the claimant, then there will be an award of damages as a remedy, perhaps an injunction, and maybe um, <clears throat> um, an equitable remedy. If the decision is in favor of the defendant, then the matter is dismissed, and, and that's the end of it. Okay, so if we do get the um, uh, uh, chapter posted, it's on page 33, and I'll be working on that. Uh, all right, so that completes um, the uh, Canadian legal system. Um, <clears throat> I want to jump now and talk about arbitration. Um, and, uh, and then when we're finished arbitration, we'll talk about the, uh, uh, the American system. And, uh, and very briefly, I think we'll talk about the Mexican legal system. Although I have to be a little cautious because I haven't been involved in those, so I don't know much, as much about it. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, where are we? That's... Um, just trying to decide whether we should go ahead with the um, arbitration, and I think we should, so let me back up here. All right, slide number uh, 30, 31, slide number 31. Um, the court cases are fraught with um, stress, uh, they're costly, and they're um, disruptive. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and the outcome is uncertain. I have, I've never, ever told a client, yes, we'll go to court and we'll win, okay? Because there are so many things that can happen that are unusual. Um, you know, for example, you get, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a judge less familiar with the nature of the action. You might get an inappropriate decision, that sort of thing. We'll go into that a little bit later on. But... Um, it's very costly. Uh, it's time consuming. It takes anywhere up to three years to get into Supreme Court on a matter, sometimes longer, sometimes uh, uh, you get in quicker, but generally about three years. Well, a lot can happen in three years. Um, the plaintiff could pass away. The defendant could go bankrupt. Witnesses can move away and disappear or die. Um, so many things. Um, the uh, subject matter of the of the court case might uh, might be destroyed, so it, it's it's justice delayed as justice denied. Basically, is there a better way? Yes, there is. It's called arbitration or alternate dispute resolution, uh, and it involves uh, mediation and arbitration. And if it goes to arbitration, then you get what is called an award. Um, okay. Uh, now, why, why go to arbitration? Um, because there are so many advantages over going to court. And we're going to go through them in, in, in a fair amount of detail. There are a, a number of disadvantages, but we're also going to go through those because it would be unethical to look at the advantages and not the disadvantages. Um, but when I go through the disadvantages, I'm going to show you that most of them are um, either... Well, I don't think they're disadvantages, or if they are, they're not significant. Okay, so looking at slide 32, uh, the very first uh, item on the list is um, uh, you get to arbitrations faster. We have in Vancouver two arbitration centers. I'm familiar most uh, with the BC International Commercial Arbitration Center. It's been around for years and years and years and years. Um, and they, uh, the um, president... Um, uh, 
uh, he used to come out and be a guest speaker for us, and he said you generally get into arbitration in about four months, three if you're lucky, a little longer if it's more complex, but four months as compared to two or three years, um, obviously it's much faster. Now it's less costly to go to arbitration. It is not inexpensive. <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> There's nothing about our legal system that is inexpensive. But um, years ago, years ago, um, I had a, a client who had a matter that was worth $35,000. And at that time, the uh, small claims limit was uh, 20000 And so he wanted to go to the BC Supreme Court so that he could claim the whole $35,000. Um, I had stopped doing litigation at that point because I was doing a lot of teaching. So we were calling around to a number of law firms, um, getting <clears throat> sort of outlining the the the. Uh, case briefly and asking for some sort of rough estimate of the um, legal fees. None of those law firms wanted to touch it. They said because <coughs> their their legal fees are going to be you know thirty five to forty thousand dollars, and you may get party and party costs, which means if you win, the defendant has to pay some of the money from the legal fees uh, to uh, the plaintiff. They said, but. Uh, that would be insignificant compared to the cost. And so you'd win in, in the BC Supreme Court and you would uh, uh, you know, ultimately not receive anything or very little at all. Um, you could uh, uh, forego the amount over the uh, small claims court limit and go in small claims. But if you're suing for 35 and you have to give up 15 so you can fit within the $20,000 small claims court limit, that's, that's not justice. So, um, uh, <clears throat> obviously, if you have um, a, an arbitration, um, I don't even know, know the figures exactly, but something along the lines of seven to eight or ten thousand dollars in uh, legal fees and expenses, um, as compared to you know thirty five dollars thirty five thousand dollars or up. All right, so it's less costly. <clears throat> not inexpensive, but less costly. Arbitrations can be easily confidential. Um, <clears throat> this is a definite advantage <coughs> because um, if I sue someone in the BC Supreme Court because I'm having a contractual dispute with them and my contractual arrangement with them contains proprietary information that gives me an advantage over my competitors, um, well, while we were working together, everything was fine, but after a dispute arose, um, I want to sue this person, I want to get rid of him, I want to keep everything confidential. Um, so we get into Supreme Court and I say, well, I'm, I'm suing him and I want to get rid of him because he's, um, uh, he's not um, <clears throat> doing my pricing system correctly. The judge says, uh, well, what's your pricing system? And you go, oh, can't tell you, it's proprietary information, it's secret. Um, then the judge will say, well, you lose, because <laughs> I, I can't tell if he's not doing it right if you won't tell me what it is. So, okay, it's a court case, so, you know, like, what could go wrong? So you tell the judge, and the judge finds in your favor, or, or not, whatever, but um, then your competitor, okay, looks and says, oh, look, uh, Peter Holden's company, he got sued. Um, I wonder what that court case was about. Well, there's no way they can find out, right? Well, yes, there is. They go down to the courthouse registry and they go, Hi, here's $5. Could I please see Holden versus such and such? And they bring the file and they give it to them. Because no Supreme Court case, no small claims court case, is supposed to be confidential unless it is a matter concerning the uh, 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 sexual assaults against minors, you know, ped pedophile cases. Those are confidential. The rest are not. Um, our, there's supposed to be transparency in our ju justice system, and so all those are open. So they get, you know, they, they bring the file, and your competitor looks in, and he goes, oh, there's his secret pricing system. That's how he competes against us. Um, here's another $2. Could I get photocopies of these pages, please? And you get the proprietary information. Go to arbitration. You just say to the arbitrator, I would like this confidential, please. And bingo, it's confidential. Nobody gets to see the, the decision of the arbiter. Uh, choice of arbiter. 
the choice of the arbiter means that you have a definite advantage. Um, I'll give you a really good example. I had a client in uh, Gibson's uh, who, uh, a lady who wanted the old windows taken out of her house, about five of them, and new wood windows put in. And she found um, a person whose work was um, impeccable. He was an artisan, okay? Um, and so what he would do is he remove the old windows and he would build these new windows and insert them with the, uh, uh, the glass. And um, it was really, really nice. Um, well, what, what happened was um, he, he said, okay, yes, I can do it. And here is my contract, which I want you to sign. And it gives you a fixed price. So this is the amount that this job is going to cost you. And so the woman thought, okay, well, that's fair. And uh, she signed it and he began working and he rips out uh, uh, some of the windows and he starts building the windows. And then he comes to her and he says, oh, um, sorry, uh, uh, <clears throat> I actually um, think that you should pay me more. You should pay me. Um, and it was almost twice what he had agreed to. And she said, oh, no, you can't do that. We have a contractual uh, agreement whereby the fixed price of this. And he says, yeah, I know, but I, I want you to pay me double or I, I, I cannot finish the job. And she, she disagreed. And so he gathered up the windows that he had made and he left the site. And she's got you know, windows partially taken out of her house. So um, she made a demand, and he, and he said, um, I'll come back, and I'll finish the job, but you've got to pay me twice the amount. And she said, but we have a contract. And he says, so what? Right? So um, she decided she was going to sue him. They get into small claims court, <clears throat> and because it was um, uh, a contracting matter and because th this woman just didn't like going to court, she asked me if I would do it, um, long-time clients, so I gave her a really good price. Um, and we go to small claims court. Now we get to the registry and I look at the docket, the list of items on the, on the list for that day and the name of the judge. And there's two matters on the, on the list. Um, there's a family law matter before us and then there's our small claims court action. Uh, and then I looked at the name of the judge and I thought, I don't recognize that judge. So I went up to the registry and I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> Seashell does it. One judge, right? Huge court. One judge. Um, so the, um, uh, I went up and I said, uh, you know, who's that judge? And the registrar said, oh, well, as you know, uh, the, the judge that was there had passed away from cancer. And we have this new judge, but he hasn't started yet. And uh, so we're bringing up. Um, judges from Vancouver and today we're bringing up a family law judge because the first item on the agenda is a family law dispute involving custody of small children very serious right and uh, and I said oh and my client said what what's wrong and I said well you know we're, we're getting a family law judge and uh, you know uh, I wonder if he or she has done very much in the way of commercial law because remember small claims does criminal matters uh, commercial matters, family law, young offenders, and traffic court. So we, we got into the court and the custody matter goes first. And I was amazed at how, how fantastic that judge was. She just cut through all the emotional garble and the, you know, and the stress and everything and, and got down to what was best for the child, made her decision and bingo. And, and, we, and I thought, wow, she ever good. Um, and then we started our trial, and I'm not certain why, but she was incredibly animos animostic. She had a, a great deal of animosity and, and showed it towards my client, I guess because there was this woman who has this house that, you know, she can put in wood windows that are really expensive, and she's got a lawyer with them. And here's this poor workman on the other side. Um, anyway... Um, we, we get into the trial and and the workman's on the stand and he's explaining why he uh, he should be paid more. And so I said, uh, here's your um, your contract, right? Yes, this contract you drafted, yes. Um, and it and it's signed by you and it's signed by the, uh, uh, the claimant. Yes, that's correct. And up here it says fixed price, labor and materials. Yes, it does. 
Okay, why do you then think um, you should be able to have twice that amount? And he said, well, because I, I realized that when I got in the job that it was going to be more expensive. Uh, but I said, but it's a fixed price contract. And the judge at that point says, oh, Mr. Holden, I think what he meant was cost plus. Well, it's his contract. He drafted it. He signed it. He said fixed price. How could he possibly have meant cost plus? Well, he's no dummy, right? And he turns to the judge and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I meant, cost plus. Um, and, uh, and I was astounded, you know. And, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're going through the trial and we get towards the end and, and she says, um, uh, well, Mr. Holden, I suppose you have a summation. Like, you know, well, of course lawyers have a summation. They, they summarize what's happened and what the client wants, right? And I said, well, yes, Your Honor, I do. And she said, well, just give it to me if it's in writing. And I said, well, you know, with respect, um, what has happened during the trial means I have to make some modifications to it. She said, oh, fine, fine, I understand that. Just, just, just give me the, um, just give it to me what you've got. Well, she's looking at her watch, and I realized what she was thinking was she's in the Sunshine Coast. If she leaves now, she'll catch the next ferry, and she'll be home in a decent time. If she doesn't get out of the court quickly enough, um, then she's going to miss that ferry, and she's going to be stuck on the coast for a while. Um, and I said, and, and I have some cases as well. And she sort of rolls her eye, and she says, all right, well, give those to me too. And I said, well, I would like to explain how they're... Uh, uh, you know how they apply. And she said, I'm sure I can figure that out. So she cuts this off, right? And then she gave a written decision, obviously because she wasn't going to come all the way up to the Sunshine Coast to give a verbal one. She gives a written decision and she had the facts all wrong. I mean, I, you know, there were seven or eight places where she just completely got the facts wrong. And then she got the law wrong. And in construction contracts, there's fixed price, there's cost plus, and there's another one, which I can't even remember because I had to actually go out and, and, and research it before I went to trial. Um, and then she completely ignored my cases. She had to. She had to because had she looked at the cases, my client would have won. But she ignores the cases, which is a, um error at law, and she makes um, she got herself involved in the trial which is an error at law, and she got the facts wrong, which are errors on the facts. Um, and she finds in favor of the uh, contractor. And my client was just, well, I was astounded. My client was just, you know, she fell over backwards. She said, like, what, are you kidding? And she said, what, do, what can I do? And I said, well, you can appeal from small claims court to the BC Supreme Court. And she said, do it. And I said, well, wait a sec. You know, your claim is for this amount of money, and by the time we pay the filing fee and <clears throat> um, and you pay legal fees to a lawyer to go to the Supreme Court of BC, you're going to wind up paying way more than, um, than you'll get. And she said, I don't care. Do it. So we filed an appeal, and we get into the Supreme Court of BC. Now, he could have brought a lawyer with him. Uh, but he didn't because he wanted small claims. It was so obvious that to him that he should just get more money because he obviously didn't bid the job correctly. Um, and so he didn't bring a lawyer, and, and I went there. Um, uh, my client came with me, but she didn't have to because this is an appeal. We don't have witnesses again. And so I got up, and I basically argued with the judge, pointing out all the errors at law and all the errors on the facts. And the Supreme Court judge is sitting there going, I mean, he couldn't believe it, right? So I'm, I'm most of the way through, and he says, Mr. Holden, he said, um, just tell me what you want, okay? So at that point, I knew I'd won, okay? So I said, well, I want this contract declared to be, a, uh, or his actions declared to be a fundamental breach of the contract. I want the parties put back in the position they were in before the contract came into existence to the best of the court's ability. And he said, fine, Mr. Holden, you got it. And the, and the and the contractor was, well, what? But but I but I won before, you know. And he was like, he just didn't know what had happened, which is a good reason why, if you're going to the Supreme Court of BC, even though they say you can do it yourself, talk to a lawyer beforehand. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, we won on appeal, which means my client basically gets the windows that are half finished, has to fix the windows in her house, 
but at least she uh, got her money back. Um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> that a long, a long anecdote to explain why you get to choose your arbiter, and that's an advantage. Um, she was a phenomenally good family law judge. <laughs> yeah, judge. Sorry. Um, but she, she probably hasn't done a commercial law suit since she got out of law school. She went through law school, went through articles, began practicing family law, practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, got appointed as a judge, a family law judge. But just because you, you don't get actually appointed as a family law judge, you get appointed as a judge and you do family law matters, except when they have a situation like this. Nine times out of ten, most judges probably could have done the commercial law thing as well as the family law thing. Um, but obviously, she just could not. So we got a bad decision. If we go to arbitration, we could, and, and it was a, a technical legal matter like that, there would be a retired judge on the list of arbiters, and we could choose that judge. But... Better still, we could choose a retired business person who had worked in the construction industry all his or her life and would actually know the difference between fixed price and cost plus. Okay. Um, so you get to choose your adjudicator. If you've got an insurance matter, you get an adjudicator that has insurance experience um, <clears throat> and, and so on and so on. Uh, now, the next advantage is fle more flexible hours. And this sounds odd because I already said it's uh, you get to a hearing faster. You do. You get to a hearing faster. The thing is about that, um, <clears throat> well, another anecdote. <laughs> Here we go again. Um, I had a, a Supreme Court trial, and I went down with my client to the Supreme Courthouse on Smythe Street, and we get down there at 9 o'clock, which you're required to do, and we go in and we go to the, the court docket listing on the wall, and we look for our courtroom. No judge has been assigned. Uh-oh. So then we go in and we go to the court registry, and they said, oh, yes, the judge is sick, so you're going to have to go over to court scheduling and get a judge. We went over to court scheduling, and, uh, I mean, judges get sick or, you know, whatever. And uh, there were quite a number of lawyers there, and they're all arguing with the clerk about who should get the judge. Finally, the clerk said, um, stop, 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 oh, quiet. He said, okay, who here has a serious matter? And I went, I do. And they all turned around and looked at me, <clears throat> and I said, yes, my case involves a woman who's going to be put into a home uh, because she's incompetent, and the family's fighting over which home she goes into, and this is really quite critical. And, and so she said, okay, you have... Uh, you know, courtroom such and such, um, uh, and the other judge, the other lawyers are looking at me with like knives in their eyes, like, but you know, I'm there to serve my my client as best I can, so I sort of jump the queue. Um, so then we go up to courtroom such and such, and um, we're sitting there and we're waiting, and it's ten o'clock. Court starts ten o'clock, ten fifteen. We're waiting ten twenty. We're waiting ten twenty five. We're waiting ten thirty. 10.35, in comes the judge. Why is she so late? Well, she's so late because she was not planning on being a sitting judge that day. That day was her day off so that she could have fun, right? No, so she could sit in her chambers and draft the decisions on all the court cases that she's been hearing. But anyway, she gets assigned to us, so she had to read the file before she came in. So we don't start until 10.35. 12 o'clock, we break for lunch. It's a two-hour lunch break so that she can go out and have martinis with her friend, right? No, so that she can go back to her chambers, make sense out of the notes that she's been taking that morning, and then um, uh, work on her other judgments and then come back at 2 o'clock. Anyway, she comes back at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, we adjourn. But we're not done. Doesn't matter, we adjourn. So we have to come back the next day, and I'm billing my client for this whole thing, right? Well, um, we had three hours and 25 minutes of court time in an eight-hour day, okay? The best you can do is four hours in an eight-hour day. That's just the way the system is set up. So um, that's a problem. But if you go to arbitration, the arbitrator, and, you know, if they're good, and most of them, I, I haven't heard any complaints, they'll, they'll arrange to meet you at 7.30 
They don't have courthouses. You either go to their center, which I think is on Broadway, or if you're both in North Vancouver, the arbitrator will come over there. He'll book a room in a hotel. He'll say, see you there at 7.30. You come in, there's little pastries and coffee, and you get at it. Okay? At, uh, you know, 10 to 12, blah, 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 your stomach goes off and you're hungry. And he says, I think we should... Uh, uh, we should get some lunch. And you go, yeah, okay. And you're just about to get up to go out to lunch. And he says, I'll have sandwiches and coffee sent in. Oh, okay. So then you work through your lunch hour. And then you work and you work and you work in the afternoon. You're, it's, it's about, you know, five o'clock. Well, court <laughs> adjourns at four. You're still there at five. And he says, okay, it's getting a little late. Where are we? And I say, well, I've finished my submissions. And the other person says, I've got maybe 10, 20 more minutes. Okay, let's just continue going. And you'll go through and get it done quickly because they are much more flexible in their hours. Um, they, the, more, the more they do, the more they get paid. Um, a judge has a salary, you know, if, if there's no court cases, which would never happen, but if there were no court cases, they'd still get paid. Okay, no, Not so with an arbitrator. Um, and so, uh, and then of course the other advantage you have with an arbitrator is they will view the scene. Um, I, I, when I was articling, I got to follow lawyers around carrying their briefcases when they went to court, and I get to watch them and learn, right? And this, I went with one that was a, a motor vehicle accident. There was like three cars involved, and it was an intersection like this where they had another road coming in there, and there was a green Toyota and a red Yaris, and they were going this way and that way. And, and the lawyers started arguing about who was where and what happened, you know, because there were three cars involved. And the judge is going, what? I don't understand. What? It was the green Toyota coming this way, and the yards, and the truck was, you yeah, know, the, the truck was over here. And finally he said, I, I, I've heard enough. I, I'm adjourning this matter. See you tomorrow. They just stopped the trial. Um, and they came back the next day, and they had a big diagram, you know, with the roads marked on it and the little cars that they could move. And it still got confusing. And it took a long time before the judge said, okay, I think I got it. In an arbitration... Um, they'll, they'll look at the scene. Um, I had Patrick Williams, who used to be the president of the BC International Commercial Arbitration Center, come out and be uh, guest speakers. Unfortunately, we cannot get him in this term for obvious reasons, um, but, uh, and besides, he's retired. So uh, he was involved in one where there was a building and there was scaffolding, and somehow the scaffolding collapsed and caused an accident in the road. And the road was quite a ways away. And they're in the arbitration, and the arbitrator says, okay, I don't understand. The scaffolding collapsed here. How did it cause motor vehicle accidents out there? Like, it's not tall enough. To... Both parties sort of look at each other and go, uh, I don't know. So he said, okay, let's go. And they go, jump in the car, vroom, they drive down. There's the building, there's the scaffolding, there's a really steep hill, there's the road. Arbitrator says, okay, I know what happened. <laughs> right? Um, so they will go out and view the scene. Now, preserving ongoing relations, an incredibly important advantage in arbitration, and I am sorry, but I've got another anecdote uh, which explains this. Because if I just say that, um, it's really not very meaningful. Um, if you sue someone and you win... And then you say, and by the way, I need more product from you next month. That's not going to happen. Okay? If you sue someone and they win, you're probably not going to order any more product from them. But even if you did because you sued them, they'll say no. Um, arbitration provides you an opportunity to preserve your ongoing working relationships while having the matter go to arbitration. First of all, just saying it's going to arbitration sounds less um, adversarial than See you in court. Um, I had uh, <clears throat> a, a corporate client. It was uh, it owned two restaurants, and the owners of the corporation were a husband and wife. Pamela, the wife, ran the business. The husband, Chris, was the uh, um, the baker. And um, they were Italian restaurants, and they sold fresh baked Italian goods. Um, they were so successful that other businesses, uh, well, 
they started selling their fresh baked goods through retail outlets, um, especially food stores. And other restaurants said, wow, we would like to, to, to sell your goods. And so Chris, the baker, worked out the, um, how to freeze it so that it could be baked on other premises uh, fresh, the dough, freeze the dough, and then baked fresh on other premises. They had two bakeries um, in their, one in each of their restaurants, um, and they had to get a third restaurant going 24-7, basically. That's, that's how well uh, they were doing. Well, one day in the, one of their restaurants, a fellow walks in, he sits down, he orders a cup of coffee and, and some of the pastry, and he has a couple of bites of the pastry and some coffee. And, and then he orders another piece of pastry and has a bite of that and some coffee. And then he orders some other pastry. And the, the server came over and said, oh, gee, I'm sorry, sir. Is everything okay? And he said, oh, yeah, fine. He said, but you're not eating at all. And he said, no, no, that's fine then. And please bring, bring me something else. And so she brings him something else. And by the time he did, you know, the fifth one, the, the server is so worried, she goes and gets Pamela, and Pamela comes out and goes, oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir, what's wrong? And he says, oh, absolutely nothing's wrong. He said, as a matter of fact, um, I would like to sell your um, freshly baked pastries in my restaurants. And Pamela says, oh, well, how many restaurants do you have? And his answer was, only 22. <laughs> Ching, ching, she gets dollar signs in her eyes, right? And uh, he, apparently he had uh, restaurants in Washington State, Oregon, and Northern California. Sort of like those family restaurants, uh, Sherry's and uh, Denny's and places like that. <clears throat> anyway, um, he says, um, have a, a supply agreement drafted by your lawyer, which means you pay for it, and um, uh, and then we'll review it, and I'll sign it, and then you can start selling me your baked uh, your your dough, so I can bake them, and and I got to do the agreement, <clears throat> which got me you know sort of goosebumps because it's uh, not only is it drafting a contract, but it's a you know a complex one, and it's cross border, okay, <clears throat> so I was I was drafting this contract, and I went to meet with Pamela for one of the drafts. And we're going and we're talking about the delivery and who's responsible for what and how it's done and when, how often and everything. Then we get down to the what we'll call boilerplate <coughs> clauses, and we'll come back to that later on. Standard clauses that lawyers generally put in, and one of the ones that I always put in every one of my contracts and have for the last 10 years is an arbitration clause. <coughs> well, I put in arbitration, and it says um, this is... Um, uh, any disputes with respect to the contract or the subject matter of the contract shall be referred to arbitration and the arbitration shall take place in the BC International Commercial Arbitration in Vancouver. And Pamela said, oh, he'll never go for that. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, because he's American and he's, you know, he's in Seattle. And I said, well, let's put it anyway. And if he says no, take that out. Then we can say, well, we'll take that out if you leave this in or, you know, use it as, as a bargaining ploy. So anyway, we leave it in and uh, we get it done and we have a meeting with him. Either he is a lawyer, which is, you know, often the case, or he's done this so many times he knows what to do. Because he's there without a lawyer. I'm there with Pamela. And we're going through the agreement. And we said, you know, this clause. And he goes, yeah, sure. This clause, yeah, sure. This clause, yeah, sure. And I'm thinking... What have I missed here? <laughs> you know, generally when you negotiate with an American on a business deal, afterwards you check to see if you still got your gold fillings because they're great at it. Uh, anyway, I thought, oh, okay, so good. And we get down to the arbitration clause and I say disputes with respect to this agreement or the subject matter thereof will be referred to arbitration in Vancouver. And he says, yeah, sure. And she goes, Pamela goes, what? Really? You agree with that? And I wanted to stomp on her foot and say, you know, shh. But um, anyway, he took he looked right in her eye and he said, Lady, have you ever gone to court in the United States? Believe me, you do not want to be there. I will happily drive three hours from Seattle to Vancouver to go to arbitration. Okay? She starts supplying him with dough. Everything is going swimmingly. I can't remember what it was like three or five months later. One shipment is defective but there was <clears throat> no one was sure whether it was uh, defective from Vancouver to Seattle or from Seattle 
he distributes it to his 22 restaurants. He said it was defective when it arrived. She said, no, the problem happened when you distributed it. And the internet, yes, no, you, no, you, no, you, no, you. And Pamela's a bit of a hothead. And she said, okay, fine, we'll see you in court. And she slams down the phone. She calls me up and I said, okay, well, <laughs> we cannot see him in court uh, for two reasons. Number one is we put in an arbitration clause. And number two, you don't want to go to court. Um, and I said, why don't you... Um, call him up and say, look, you know, uh, got a little arg uh, argumentative there. Um, and I've taken the file and I've given it to my assistants, 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 assistant. And um, uh, perhaps you could do the same and then we'll let them discuss the matter. Because in actual fact, it's either my insurance company that's going to pay for it or your insurance company's going to pay for it. And, you know, we shouldn't waste our time on this. And he said... That's a good idea because I need more product from you next month. Sue him and see if he will say that. Okay, so you can preserve on ongoing relations. Now, I, I, I put in arbitration clause in my contracts for 10 years and there's only been about two, two disputes and they've both been resolved through mediation. Um, so I'm probably shooting myself in the foot because I'm not getting this much, wasn't getting this much court work, but I have happier clients. Okay, so you can preserve ongoing relationships. The other one is uh, advantage is the award is final and binding. It says that right in the Arbitration Act or the International Commercial Arbitration Act. Bingo, that's it. You have one shot. After that, you lose, you lose. You win, you win. Um, now you think, oh, I lost, but uh, you know, I I should have won. Too bad. Okay. But at least it's over. You don't have to wait three years to get into the Supreme Court, lose, appeal, wait two years to get into appeal court. Because as I say, you know, the defendant goes out of business and bingo, you've gone through all that and nothing happens. So the award's final and binding. At least you don't have the sword of Damocles dangling over your head. Um, it's enforceable as a judgment. How can it be? He's not a judge or she's not a judge. They're just an arbitrator. Well, you get your arbitral award. You go down to the courthouse and you say, hi, here's my arbitral award. And they go, they stamp it. You pay some money and bingo, it's turned into a judgment, which you can then start to use to enforce your judgment, which means try to collect your money. Okay. Uh, and then the other advantage is it's enforceable internationally. Which is, and there's a, a bit of a funny story behind that too. Um, in 1958, the the United Nations um, <clears throat> had, had uh, the League of Nations before it, and the United Nations after World War II, um, always worked towards uh, making international relationships better. Okay, and commercial matters, they they work to make commerce better. Um, so you have the uh, International uh, Convention on the Carriage of Goods by Air, you've got the International Convention on the Carriage of Goods by Sea, you've got the uh, uh, International Convention on, on the International Sale of Goods, um, all sorts of conventions, right? Well, in 1958, um, the United Nations passed a convention um, which would allow a BC judgment to be enforceable in Mexico or in France or in the United States or in, you know, uh, Colombia or you know Australia <clears throat> um, and vice versa um, <clears throat> so that uh, uh, you know it would facilitate business disputes could be settled uh, claims could be paid um, mo most countries signed the convention um, but the convention does not become law just because the country signs it they have to do what they call enabling legislation so the um, uh, the U.S. Mexican Canadian um, agreement on trade, uh, which was renegotiated by Trump, uh, and um, uh, just because he renegotiated it doesn't mean it was law. It took Congress a long time to actually get around to sign it, and uh, Mexico signed it, and I I believe we signed it. I'm not sure. So you have to have this enabling legislation. Well, after the uh, Convention on the International Enforcement of Judgments was passed by um, the United Nations, um, all these countries said, whoa, wait a sec, yeah, we're getting up jurisdiction. It means courts in other countries can affect Canada and vice versa. 
And so only about five countries in the world actually passed enabling legislation to make this applicable. Okay? And they're not the, you know, the barn burner countries as far as commerce goes. The United States didn't do it. England didn't do it. Canada didn't do it. Um, uh, I don't even think China was involved then. <clears throat> All European countries didn't do it with the exception of a couple. So it was defunct. It was of no, no force and effect. But at the same time, in 1958, they passed a convention for the international enforcement of arbitral awards. All the countries are signed the convention, and then they all acted, most of them anyway, um, enacted enabling legislation, okay? Um, and so it becomes the law of the land. Why would they do that? Well, hardly anybody was doing any arbitrations back in 1958. So it wasn't considered to be of any real significance. Now, however, um, that allows <clears throat> a... Um, arbitral award from British Columbia to be changed into a judgment taken down to Jalisco, Mexico, and you can enforce it without going through another trial. If I took a judgment of a court in BC down to Jalisco, Mexico, they would say, oh, well, you got common law, we got civil law, you better, you know, you better have another hearing here. And it could be doubly costly and twice the delays in order to get your judgment registered. Um, a judgment from BC was taken down to to uh, Missouri, and uh, and um, I knew about this one. And it, the uh, the judge down there, when they tried to register, the judge down there said, uh, first of all, he was confused. He thought Columbia, British Columbia, was in South America, um, and then he said, uh, uh, "No foreign judge is going to tell me what I can do in my state, in his state." And he refused to allow it to be registered down there, which means we would have had to appeal to the Court of Appeal in that state. And it was just getting too costly for the client. He said, okay, just forget the thing. But an, an arbitral, arbitral award can be registered down there, no problem. Okay, so those are the advantages. The disadvantages, no body of precedent. Well, if um, arbitrations are confidential, there's no way that that arbitration can ever be used as precedent in a subsequent arbitration. So that is a disadvantage, but it's insignificant because when we had the Arbitration Act or the International Commercial Arbitration Act passed, people did not stop going to court. There are still thousands and thousands of court cases taking place. Those court case decisions can be precedent. So the fact that a few arbitrations aren't being precedent um, is not a significant disadvantage. Limitation on equitable relief. Uh, there are equitable remedies besides the common law remedies of um, damages and injunction. Quick example, specific performance. I want to buy a piece of property. The law has a rule that no pieces of property are identical. So if I wanted to buy that property and you said, sure, and then I gave you the deposit and you give the money back and say, no, I don't want to go through with it, you're breaking your contract. Um, <clears throat> so they... They, the judge says, well, you know, take the damages and buy another piece of property. Well, the other piece of property isn't identical. You don't want another piece of property. You want that lot. So um, courts have the inherent jurisdiction besides the legal jurisdiction of damages and injunction to say specific performance. You signed a contract. You agreed to it. You have to now specifically perform it by giving that person the property. Okay, that works for land. Um, other things like, well, let's say I wanted to buy the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I wish I had the money to buy the Mona Lisa. <clears throat> um, anyway, I want to buy the Mona Lisa, and he refuses to sell it. Well, damages is not an adequate award, okay? And <clears throat> he gives me a bit of damages and says, buy a different painting. No, I want this Mona Lisa. There's only one of them. So I would, I would argue specific performance. He must... <clears throat> perform the contract and give me the Mona Lisa. Well, the courts can do that. Arbitrators can't. Right in the Arbitration Act, it's, it, it says they are not judges, ergo they do not have the inherent jurisdiction to give equitable relief. That would be a really big disadvantage if that section ended there. But it doesn't. It goes on to say, cannot grant equitable relief unless the arbitration clause specifically provides for it. So that cannot be um, a um, um, disadvantage. 
unless of course you don't get a lawyer to draft your arbitration clause okay um, so if you just want, went onto the arbitration website they have sample clauses you pick one you use it you're not going to get the echo remedies okay so that you are at a disadvantage but if you go to a lawyer like if you came to me for example I have a standard arbitration clause which includes that the arbiter can grant equitable rewards. So again, it's not a real disadvantage. Okay, no day in court. This is on the list. Um, I think it's a bit of a joke, um, but I had a Supreme Court judge, no, pardon me, a Court of Appeal judge come out and talk to my class years ago, and <clears throat> he specifically talked about the court process and then had questions about um, arbitration. And he said, well, one of the disadvantages of arbitration over going to court is that the people involved do not feel as though they had their day in court. And I almost laughed. <laughs> and then I realized he was being serious. Um, and of course, he has to be serious. He's a judge. So he has to feel like people feel satisfied if they go through the court system. Um, <clears throat> I don't think... I have ever seen or would ever see um, somebody get sued and lose and say, gosh, girl, gee, I lost, but I feel so good that I had my day in court. Or a plaintiff that sues somebody because they owe them money, they don't get their money, and they say, darn it, I didn't get my money, but, well, I didn't get my day, I had my day in court, so I guess everything's okay. So, um... I put it on there because, after all, he is a court of appeal judge, and I am just a professor at the university. But I don't, I don't think it's a serious disadvantage. Limited right of appeal, as I mentioned, it's final and binding. Um, there is a section in the Arbitration Act, in the International Commercial Arbitration Act, that says appeals can or awards may be appealed, but only in very restricted circumstances. So if I was an arbiter and I said, yes, there was a binding, valid contract between the people, but I'm just not going to enforce it. Well, that would be a, a palpable error at law. Okay. And <clears throat> you could appeal to the courts. But if there is a binding contract and I interpret it to mean something different than the parties, um, you don't get to appeal that. Because that's my award based on how I read the contract, not um, not a error at law. Okay, so there are you can appeal, but it's it's very very restrictive. All right, now the fifth um, disadvantage is um, that uh, it's unethical or or legal. Uh, or there could be unethical or Ill or illegal uses of it, and that came up in the. Heller versus Uber case. Um, uh, Heller was a Uber driver in Ontario, and Uber, of course, is a company out of Maryland, the United States, and Heller signed a contract, uh, and it was a take-it-or-leave-it contract. You don't get to negotiate with them, so he signed it. And then um, Uber um, dismissed him as a driver, and he went to the Employment Standards Branch in Ontario and filed a claim. And Uber Technologies said, no, you cannot do that. You signed a contract that says this matter is supposed to go to arbitration. And usually, that would be the end of it. Okay, um, Because if you have a contract that says it goes to arbitration, the courts have no jurisdiction to hear it. The problem in this case was Uber said, uh, you have to take this matter to arbitration. And oh, by the way, the arbitration takes place in the Netherlands, in Europe. And the judge went, what has a U.S. company that's dealing with a Canadian driver, what's the connection with the arbitration center in Amsterdam? And the only connection was Uber realized there's no way that Heller could afford to fly to the Netherlands and and go through an arbitration there so he would lose his rights and the judge said that clause is unconscionable and is therefore void 
which meant that his claim at the Employment Standards Branch could go ahead. All right? Um, because the judge said it's un, uh, there's always a potential that um, <clears throat> I'm big and um, I say to you, um, this is going to go to arbitration in New York and you're a Canadian business and you have no real um, a way of negotiating out of that. So you accept it, right? And that's a bit unethical. But the more ethical approach would be to say, um, if we go after you, it's in New York. If you go after us, it's in Ontario. Okay, that would be ethical, right? So it could be unethical. And that and that is a problem because there, um, the courts deal with illegal matters. But in this particular case, the court said it is illegal to do that. And so that's unconscionable and it was struck down. So there can be unethical and illegal uses of arbitration clauses. All right, that's a serious problem. Uh, so far as in the world uh, that I know of, we are the only jurisdiction, meaning Canada, um, that uh, has taken that approach against the, an unethical um, and one-sided arbitration clause. Because that's an Ontario decision, of course, of the Ontario Court of Appeal, I believe, um, then it would be um, equally applicable in British Columbia because if a situation came up in BC, BC could follow that law. To conclude, um, we have three statutes. We have the um, Arbitration Act. So a BC business going after a BC business can go to arbitration in BC under the Arbitration Act. If it's a BC business and a business in any other country, you can go under the International Commercial Arbitration Act. Um, if it's one of the um, uh, USMCA countries instead of the North American Free Trade uh, um, parties, uh, then you can go to the Commercial Arbitration and Mediation Center of the Americas, or CAMPCA, according to Article 2022 of the um, agreement. Um, <clears throat> the, and under that, um, the, when, the, when the negotiators put that in, they didn't do that in the last sort of go-around. This was a previous amendment to the North American Free Trade Act. Um, they decided that the disputes under the North American Free Trade Act were solving public law matters. Nothing for private law, though. So if I was selling Me someone in Mexico milk and they didn't pay, I could not go after that company under NAFTA because it, there was no public law aspect to that. It's just a private contract. So to make NAFTA even better, the negotiators put in this Article 2022, which would give... Um, the BC business an avenue to go to arbitration instead of trying to sue a company in, in Mexico, okay? Um, the uh, BC uh, International Commercial Arbitration Center in Vancouver is the center for Canada. There's one in New York for the United States and there's one in Mexico City for um, uh, Mexico and there's one in Quebec City for Quebec. Uh, how did this all happen? Well, Obviously, Mexico City, because that's the capital of the U.S., North America, um, New York, because uh, New York uh, had a years and years and years an arbitration center. In Canada, you would think it was either Ottawa as the, as the capital or Toronto as the, one of the key uh, commercial centers. But no, they chose Vancouver because Vancouver had the B.C. International Commercial Arbitration Center that had been operating for years. OK, so there's an advantage. Um, the, when I talked to Patrick Williams, there has never been a uh, Vancouver um, uh, uh, arbitration under CAMPCA. So it's there, but it hasn't been used. Okay, that's good because there is the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of International Foreign Arbitral Awards, which means that the, um, <clears throat> the awards have international application. Right at the bottom of slide... Uh, uh, 34, it says risk management practice. What this means is um, how do you reduce the risk in an international contract? And one of the ways is to put in an arbitration clause. If you do not put an arbitration clause in that contract, you will not get to arbitration. So let's say you and I have a contract. We do not have a clause in there. 
and I say, okay, I'm going to sue you. Uh, oh, wait, no, no. Let's agree to go to arbitration because it's faster and that's an advantage to me and it's less expensive and that's an advantage to me. Um, what are you going to say? You're going to say, no, see you in court, buddy, because then I have to go down, meet with my lawyer, write out a $35,000 retainer to them so that they'll fight the court case. That's probably to start. It's going to be way more than that if it's an international contract. Well, so you'll never agree at the, more, at the point of the dispute. But if we put that clause in the contract and I say, okay, we're going to arbitration, you go, no, I want to go to court. Too bad, buddy. We've got an arbitration clause and you've agreed and it's going to arbitration. Okay, so you should put an arbitration clause in there and you should make sure your, your lawyer drafts it. Um, a lot of self-help stuff out there. And when you go to the BC International Commercial Arbitration site, it actually has some draft arbitration clauses. So you take one of those and you use it. What do I have to hire a lawyer for? <laughs> like, why, why, you know, hire a lawyer and have them charge me, you know, 250 or, you know, $400 to put in a clause? Well, would you remember to put in the equitable relief clause? And then the other thing is, when I draft my arbitration awards, I suddenly realized that arbitrations are less costly than court but still very expensive. So if the matter is worth less than $35,000, I put in a clause that says the parties can decide whether they go to a small claims court, and if they decide, then that's it. Or if they decide they want to go to arbitration, they go to arbitration. So if the matter was $25,000, I wouldn't go to arbitration. What I would do is I would say, okay, I'm going to go to small claims court because the limit of small claims court is $35,000. My claim's twenty-five, dollars so I qualify to go there. I can handle the dispute myself, and I do not have to hire a lawyer. Small claims court is set up so you can do it yourself. Okay, But if it's an $80,000 matter, hey, you cannot go to small claims court. You do not want to go to the Supreme Court of BC. That's when the arbitration clause kicks in. So risk management practice... Um, put in an arbitration clause and make sure that it's drafted by your lawyer. All right, so that finishes the uh, Canadian legal system and the next topic will be the U.S. Uh, legal system and we'll start a new video for that one. So that's all for today. Thank you very much.